Guess what, folks? It's time to fit a kitchen. Hiya folks, welcome back to the show. Mrs. Mac has her kitchen fitting whip out and it's time to get our brand new kitchen fitted. I am literally surrounded in boxes and packaging material at the minute and I figured I would take you through my process for fitting a kitchen. As per usual, I am not a kitchen fitter, but I have fitted many kitchens over the years. So hopefully you can gain something from this. If not, you can tell us what I'm doing wrongly in the comments below. Distracted looking at blue tits. I'm not going to show you us unpackaging boxes because I don't think that's a very productive use of our time. So we'll get everything unwrapped and checked and I'll come back to you. Right, we're all unpacked. Oh, I've got the bulk of the packaging out the road at least and uh, yeah really quite impressed with this all pre-assembled all fully glued really nicely built units nice thick back panels on them as well you can't really see but it's about looks like a 12 mil back panel no sorry nine mil back panel and then we've also got a uh, um, 18 mil support piece at the top we have got one box left to unpack here and this is full of goodies. I'm really quite excited to go through this because check out the, the legs. I've never seen beefy legs like that for kitchen units before. They are awesome. Here's the layout that we're working to. So this is the extractor here. That is the extractor. And when you're looking at that side of the kitchen, it's this wall here that we are looking at. Before we do anything though, let's unpack this box of goodies. It's so much easier just sorting things out like this and you can immediately kind of see what you've got and you're not then fussing around looking for a particular screw or, or fitting. The good news to start off with, I've never fitted one of these particular kitchens before and everything looks really good quality. We've got proper uh, posi drive screws, they're not awful Phillips screws and even the dowels for the cams are posi drive as well, which they should be. One box left to unpack, technical fitting guide booklet. A big box for technical fitting guide. What's this? Mmm, a tasty little treat. Oh. oh, look at that. <laughs> We've got tea and biscuits. Yorkshire flapjacks. Nice touch. And we've got a technical guide. Good grief. I don't think I've ever bought a kitchen that came with instructions. Impressive. Oh, cool. Okay. Now before I go on, my spidey sense is tingling and I can just feel the comments being generated as we speak. Yes, I am fitting a kitchen on top of a floating floor. 
Now, I am doing this because it's my kitchen. If I was doing this for a customer, I probably wouldn't take the gamble. Although, please remember, I am the guy who used to get called out to fix broken kitchens and do all sorts of snagging, and I've worked in thousands of houses over the years, and I have never seen a problem caused by installing a kitchen on top of a floating floor. This is a section of the floor that I'm using, which you may have already seen the video of when I fitted the floor. We do have a full 12 millimeter expansion gap around the entire floor and you absolutely do need to account for expansion and contraction especially if you're in an environment that's subject to massive deviations in humidity let me give you a very very quick 101 on the expansion and contraction of wood first of all here is a piece of wood imagine a piece of wood like a whole bunch of drinking straws so although you can't really see them if you put a microscope on that end there are little holes going all the way through the grain of the wood and it generally runs kind of in that direction. So imagine these straws are an enlarged version of what's going on inside here. And the thing is, when these get damp, they swell up and when they dry out, they contract. And that means that wood has a habit of expanding and contracting across the grain. So in really humid environments, the wood will get wider and in really dry environments, the wood will get narrower. It's one of the biggest reasons for cracks in new build properties because generally when a house is being built, all of the wood gets very, very wet. But then once the house becomes weather tight and you've got the central heating on over a couple of years, that wood will dry out and it will contract by a substantial amount. Nothing to worry about, fill the cracks, get on with your life. You don't tend to get this problem with older properties because the wood has already dried out. But trust me, when that house was brand new, you would have had exactly the same cracking and things like that in every piece of timber in the property. So the key takeaway, wood expands across the grain, but it doesn't expand and contract very much along the grain. It does a little bit, so if you're making fine furniture, you still need to think about it, but for most general construction projects, don't worry too much about expansion and contraction in that direction, but do think about it across the grain. Remember the straws. Now, the wood that we've used for our floor is an engineered wood. That means it's based on a plywood substrate. And plywood has lots of layers. You can see the layers here, if we can get the camera to focus on that. And with plywood, the grain runs alternately. So on one layer, the grain will run that way, the next layer that way, next layer that way, next layer that way. And then obviously you've got the top layer here that you can see where the grain runs in that direction. The other thing worth mentioning here is that this floor is fully pre-sealed as well. So really there's not an opportunity for moisture to get in from the top. All of the edges are fully glued. So any moisture that's gonna get into this wood is gonna happen over a very, very long period of time. So that's gonna massively slow down the penetration of any humidity in the atmosphere being able to actually get into this wood in the first place. And because we monitor the temperature and humidity and log it over a long period of time, I can kind of predict whether or not there's gonna be a problem before it even happens. As a result of that, Engineered flooring is very stable, and although they do recommend the 12 millimeter gap all the way around the room, I've just simply never seen it move. As long as you keep an eye on your humidity levels, in my view, it's not a problem worth worrying about too much. Having said that, if you are fitting it for a customer, you need to follow all of the recommended instructions to make sure that you don't have any comeback coming to bite you in the backside later down the line. There are various things that you can do to plan for that if you want to make sure that the kitchen floor sitting on top of this doesn't cause a problem. Personally, I think kitchen legs on a unit sitting on top of this, the wood would be able to move that one or two millimeters of its own accord anyway. There's more than that in terms of play in the plastic legs anyway. So even if the unit above it can't move the legs would have that play in it so the legs aren't an issue where you might run into problems is where you have to attach things to the floor what i would generally do is cut a 25 mil hole in this attach it through into the subfloor below and just make sure that whatever you're attaching isn't too firmly attached onto your floating floor and that'll just give you your stability that you need while allowing for effectively 12 and a half millimeters of expansion in any direction but for the situation that we've got here, I've been keeping a close eye on humidity and temperature. We installed the floor when it was around 55% relative humidity. And to be honest, 
we're always between kind of 40 and 60% anyway, and we're keeping a close eye on that with a humidity monitor. When the central heating's on, the house dries out quite a lot, so the humidity levels will drop. And also when we've got the stove going, that really drops the humidity, but it generally doesn't go anything below about 40%. And obviously I'm living in the property, so if it becomes a problem, I can address it straight away, but I don't think it will. I will report back and let you know later down the line. One of the reasons, by the way, that I want the floor under all of the units is that the most common problem that I've seen over the years is a dishwasher leaking and the water from the dishwasher going underneath the floating floor and that will cause a problem that will cause major bowing and it never ever dries out unless you lift the whole floor up it just doesn't dry out properly so in this kind of situation where we've got a fridge freezer we've got a stove we've got a dishwasher all of that needs to be above floor level anyway. So the general takeaway from this is do as I say, not as I do. These legs are quite nifty, by the way. Basically, they've got a little uh, gauge on the side and by default, they're set to the mid level. But what you've got on the inside of this when you take the leg off is that you've got these two little pins here. And as long as those pins are on, when you tighten the leg up, if you just tighten it gently, it by default goes exactly there to the middle position. So as long as your floors are perfectly level, then that should work for all of your legs. But if you do need to make an adjustment to that, all you do is a, a firm kind of uh, tighten like that, and that basically breaks those little legs off. And then you've got full control to either lower them or heighten them as much as you want. You see those little legs are, are kind of broken off now. I'm not gonna lie, this big unit was a challenge to build. It took, we built it on its side and then it took uh, three of us to lift it onto its uh, kind of feet. Well, what we did is we, we didn't put the feet on until after it was vertical. And then we put something underneath it, lifted the whole thing up, put the feet on and then took the, the just I had my toolbox underneath it and that works fairly well for getting the feet on afterwards. There's no way that you would get the feet on first and turn it vertical without snapping the feet off. Anyway, that's in, and because this is the hardest thing to move, we're gonna kind of use this as our reference point for everything. We've got the cutouts done for the electrics. This is gonna be for the fridge power supply down here. This is gonna be for a charging station inside the cupboard up here. We've also got a cutout for the water supply for the fridge down at that side. And over on the other side of the cupboard, we've got a socket here, potentially for a microwave. The cooker point is gonna be on the right-hand side here. And we've got a lighting point here. That lighting point so that we can potentially have lights in the cupboard. So lots of cutouts, very fiddly, big, difficult cupboard to move with one, two, three, four cutouts in this and then two cutouts in the other one. So the critical thing now is that we get this unit perfectly level in every direction level, plumb, everything. So at the moment, we just need it to lean a tiny bit back. I mean, the floors in, in here are pretty level anyway, but sometimes when you're moving the unit around, the feet can spin a little bit. So I can get to that back foot there. Uh, So I'm not going to lie, that took forever to get this unit perfect, but uh, yeah, that is pretty much as good as we can get. This unit has seven legs, so you kind of adjust one thing and it throws another thing out, but uh, we're pretty good with that. So this is going to be our reference point for everything. So I'll quickly match up these ones to that unit, which is relatively straightforward because these have only got four legs each. So we'll align the bottoms first. Ideally, we'd clamp these two together, but because of this corner piece, it's a, a bit awkward, so it's not really too much of a problem. I can just kind of hold that like that for now while I just adjust these legs. Good enough. They're all going to be attached together. There's still an end panel to go on here, but I just want to get this one perfectly lined up first, and then we can move it out the road a little bit to get the end panel in.
Happy with all that. So time to get the laser out and find somewhere to put it. I think I'll probably just shove it on the back of the fridge there. Hopefully you can see the laser line there, but it is just there. We're going to use that as a reference point. We'll measure down from that to the top of this unit. And that is exactly 63 millimetres. So I'll just quickly make note of that, 63. And then all round, I'm just going to do a little mark on the laser line. And we'll mark 63 down from that. And then I'm just going to mark on the wall in pencil, a perfect straight line at that 63 mil below the laser line. I will use a level to do it, but we've just got the laser as a reference point, just because, you know, you can go out with a level over a long distance. The laser should be perfect all the way around the room. There's a dishwasher to go here. This one can't go in until I've done the cutout for the water, but I can't do the cutout for the water until I've worked out exactly where this unit's going to come away from this back wall. In fact, I might as well talk about that now very, very quickly, and then I can kind of get on with it and then come back to you. So this is a corner unit and it can't go back against the wall quite yet because I didn't need to do a little cut out for the uh, water pipe for the outside tap, just right down at the bottom of the unit. Uh, but once I've done that, this will go against this wall. But what they suggest is a 130 mil gap between that side panel and the wall over here and a 30 mil gap between this panel and this panel and then you have a little corner fillet in here to fill up this gap this bit comes off you just move it along a bit and then you reattach it if you don't do that then when you open your drawers then your drawers will hit your handles of this cupboard so it's really important that you've got a gap here and an appropriate gap at the back here, otherwise this door wouldn't be able to open. But yeah, in a nutshell, that's how corny units work. A little bit further on now, and story so far, things are progressing well, although I'm sure we're missing an end panel. We'll come back to that. We did order three end panels, we only seem to have two, which is unusual. Anyway, everything is kind of dry fitted. Most of the cutouts needed for utilities are done. Units that can be clamped together are clamped together. Obviously, we've got nothing here because this is where the dishwasher is going. But there's a lot of things that you have to get right at this stage. Otherwise, it'll make life very awkward later down the line. One of the other things that's worth doing on a run like this, where we've got a gap in the middle, we've, we haven't really got a reference point. So what I've done is run a string line from the corner of this unit all the way up to the corner of this unit because the walls aren't necessarily perfectly straight and that just allows us to get everything in a kind of a plane, in a perfect line. So these units are perfectly aligned with this unit here. Over on this side, they recommend 130 mil gap at the back here and a 50 mil gap here. Remember this panel will come off and it'll move backwards and then it'll butt up to the, the corner trim. As I say, obviously everything is perfectly level in every direction. I've checked all the way across the units at the back and all the way across there. These are all absolutely as bob on as you can get. And then the other thing is to get your spacing for the dishwasher correct. This has to be 600 mil exactly. If you don't get that exactly right, it's gonna cause problems getting your door alignment correct later down the line. We've got a whole load of end panels to fit. So this needs an end panel that'll go all the way down to the floor. And this will need an end panel down the floor and that will need an end panel down the floor as well. And then that kind of frames in where the range is going to be going. I still need to fit the top box for the fridge, but obviously that needs an end panel on this far side to support it. Otherwise it's just kind of hanging about in the breeze and clamp it onto this unit. But the end panel is probably going to need scribe to the wall. So I'll probably put some sort of temporary support underneath it to hold it while I get the end panel in place so that I can do the scribe and then we can put that in, that'll hold it all together. So I'm not going to tackle that yet. I think the next job really is to get everything attached to the wall permanently. To do that, I'm using a combination of space plugs and these space plugs are, are very handy for that because they are adjustable and they can fit pretty much kind of any sensible gap behind the units and brackets as well. So we'll get everything permanently fixed in place.
Right, we are up to a whole a lot of scribing and this is where the skill of a kitchen fitter really comes into their own. Anyone who says, oh, anyone can fit a kitchen, yeah, right, until you start scribing everything, you find out how difficult this actually is. I can do it, it takes me a long time, but uh, yeah, kitchen fitters will do this so quickly because uh, they're just used to doing it every day, but it takes a lot of skill. I haven't got time to make an in-depth scribing tutorial in this video and I'm sure other people have done much better ones than I would make anyway. The thing that we're aiming for, the end game if you like, I've already done this end panel here. So this end panel, it had to be cut to the exact height of this unit but the main thing was scribing it to this back wall over here. So that's ultimately what we're aiming for. So we've got this one to do here which um, I'll not do that one yet. Uh, this big back one is pretty much done I just need to cut it to height but the one I want to show you is this one here I'm just going to talk about it very very briefly so all I've done is I've clamped the end panel onto the unit and I've made sure that we've got the same gap all the way down so I think we've got off the top of my head a 70 mil gap whatever so it's the gap from there to there is exactly the same at the top as it is at the bottom and then I've just grabbed a door and I've put a mark on the end panel the thickness of the door. So if you imagine the door is going to come out to that line there. So in other words, we need to chop off that amount, but not from this side. We need to chop it off from the back because we need to keep this nice edge here. And ultimately it's the back edge that needs to follow the plaster, which is never straight. So lots of ways you can do this, but the way I do it is I just get a pair of compasses you need the sort that can lock in position and preferably not this sort that's bendy so you just have to be careful not to bend it and all I'm going to do is I'm going to put that side there on that line and the lead on the edge of the door so that's basically what we're taking off and then we'll just go around to the back edge and we just follow the wall. So you can see I've already marked it, but we just follow the wall down like that. As you can see, not much needs taken off. It's just a little bit at that top, to be honest. And we also need to cut around these pipes at the bottom. So all I'm gonna do is come around like that and make sure we've got a nice clear mark. I don't need to be like mega accurate. The fridge is gonna be here, so you're not gonna see it, but there we go, we've got our marks on there. And then all I do is I cut that with the jigsaw. We're gonna to have to cut from the top so it'll be a clean cut blade. Just wanted to show you this little bit here where the range is going because it's quite interesting. Basically to get the gap right, there's an end panel to go on here, but to get the gap correct, we need to shuffle this unit along just a tiny little bit, but that means we need a, a filler piece down that end. So we might as well get that filler piece put in now, and then we'll do the scribe of the end panel for this unit, basically because this filler piece is gonna set the distance. So I've moved this unit along this little bit. All of this is fixed in. I still need to attach this tall right hand bit in, but it's pretty much ready to go. But all we need to do is just measure this gap here and take off about three millimeters to allow for a gap down that side. So we are looking at 31, so 28 mil down that edge. So basically one of these little filler strips needs trimmed down to 28 mil. So table saws are all set up and uh, we're at a point in the build where my big kind of rip blade, of the 40 tooth rip blade, I've taken off this and I've now put the 60 tooth blade on because it gives a, a much finer cut for this sort of slightly more inter intricate work. I do generally prefer the 60 tooth blade but when you're doing a lot of like 
rip cuts of great big bits of wet wood and things like that um, the the 40 tooth tends to work a little bit better for that but anyway we're onto this 28 mil there's a 30 28 there we go that's the kind of cut you can expect from the 60 tooth blade so that'll just go in that little gap like that which I will do very shortly so for fixing the end panels all I've done is I've drilled through this base unit um, I've drilled through from the inside to the outside because any blowouts gonna be covered up by the panel so the blowout doesn't really matter on that side and because these ones uh, or this one particularly I have had to scribe it very very slightly to the floor and I don't like leaving a cut edge like this on the floor so all I'm using is uh, yacht varnish which is what I happen to have kicking about but I'm just using it to seal the bottom normally you would use like a primer or something but the disadvantage of a primer is obviously then you could end up marking your floor when you put the board in so what I don't want is wet white paint at the bottom of this whereas if I just use a clear varnish like this a yacht varnish is like incredibly hard wearing and b it'll completely seal this bottom edge to stop any moisture potentially getting into the board and I can fit the end panel straight away because if any of this gets on the floor it doesn't matter because it's a wooden floor and I can just wipe it off I am running very short on 30 mil screws you're going to need a selection of different size screws for all of this by the way I'm using 30 mils for attaching the end panels on I'm also using some 20 mil 25 mil screws for some bits and 16 mil screws for other bits as well you need really long screws if you're going to go through space plugs into dot and dab at the back as well I've completely run out of really long screws which is a bit annoying I need to go and buy some blethering as per usual where's my drill it's tricky doing this with the draw in place but what you can do is uh, just kind of line everything up with a spare door that's good there because this obviously needs to be flush to the door needless to say whatever you do don't pop out the other side of your end panel So we're just about done we ran into a slight problem with the top box because for some reason it came dry assembled I'm not entirely sure why we didn't find out until we had it above our heads and the whole thing nearly fell to bits if anyone knows why that would come dry assembled please let us know in the comments below because there was literally no glue in the joints but it was obviously deliberately done that way but it nearly caused quite a serious accident because as I say it was above our heads when 
the, one of the panels nearly fell off and then the whole carcass would have just fallen to bits. I mean, you sometimes do that if you're going to replace one of the sides with an end panel, but you're not going to be doing that in this situation. Um, I can't, just no idea why they did it like that. Anyway, I'll quickly show you around a few bits before everything's all covered up. Uh, the worktop people are coming tomorrow to template up for quartz worktops. So once the worktops are in, you're not going to be able to see down here anymore and see how I've done certain things. So first off, and I did film it, but the camera had all sorts of problems focusing on this great big area of green for some reason. But this end panel is just held on with uh, brackets at the top and over there. And there's another one at the front here. And then there's brackets into the floor right at the bottom as well. So this end panel is absolutely solid and not going anywhere. As I say, we're missing the end panel for that and it'll not be getting sent out for a couple of weeks because it has to be custom made. The plinths are all cut and they're kind of just temporarily in. They're not clipped in quite yet because uh, there's a few other little bits and pieces I want to do behind the scenes. Sorry, I've got all the leftover bits of uh, cornice and, and things up here at a minute. You can see what I've done here on this corner joint. This is just to maintain this gap here so that this kind of doesn't move and you end up with a weird gap down that edge. So we've got a space plug screwed all the way through between the two units there. At the back, it's, um, as I say, I mentioned earlier, brackets and space plugs. So we've got a great big bracket through there. Space plugs at the back here. Bearing in mind, once the worktops are on this, it can't go anywhere. It's mainly to keep everything nice and solid while the worktops are installed. And then all the way around here, we've got obviously our dishwasher gap here and similar story here, space plug just to maintain this gap here for the little uh, corner post. Again, this unit's held in with space plugs screwed through behind the drawers and same with this unit over here. Giant corner unit we've already talked about and we've got the top box all installed as well. I'll just show you as well how I fitted this trim around the edges. So this basically nicely boxes in the fridge. You should really have another big tall unit on the left hand side of a top box like this, but it can be done just with an end panel and that's the way we've done it because we didn't want it eating into this side of the room too much because we've got a radiator down here and it would have caused various problems. So we've done it just with an end panel on the end and it nicely houses in the fridge. It does mean we have to provide a bit of extra support for the end panel, which is just with brackets all down the wall side. And then it's just fixed into the floor at the bottom there and it's not going anywhere. That's absolutely solid. It's a bit dark in here, so hopefully you can see, but in terms of the trims for the fridge housing, these are just held in with these little, I call them Conti brackets, but uh, I can't remember the official name of them. I've always called them Conti brackets. I think that's who originally made them. So they just hold in the little side strip all the way down that edge. I still need to run in the water supply and I think I might make a separate video about that. There's a few things where I'm going to make, rather than this video being even longer than it already is, I'll make a separate video about all the remaining little bits that need to be done. Similar story with the dishwasher. I still need to do the install on that. And I think I'll do a video on that as well. Little tip for you as well. Just try and leave the door open ajar. I've just used a little piece of polystyrene there to wedge it open, but it just stops it smelling because the units are tested before they're sent out. So there is normally a little bit of water in them and it just lets some air circulate in. So any water in it can dry out. There's not very much cornice to fit. It's only a little bit up at the top there and they've sent some pelmet as well which i'm not entirely sure why but um i guess we've got some spare pelmet which we can maybe use for something later down the line but yeah don't forget to hit subscribe and we'll have a separate video about the cornice the dishwasher and the fridge and anything else i've forgotten about for now folks i think we'll leave it there for this one hopefully i've covered enough of fitting a kitchen that you can get a general idea of what's involved don't really need these anymore. As you be very aware, if you follow this channel, it's not the channel of big reveal shots. I wanna show you what's actually involved in a project and talk about 
the detail that you might not be aware of behind the scenes that you're not going to see on DIY shows and things like that. You will see a reveal of this later down the line, but there's a lot more work to do in the final kind of presentation stage, like decorating, lighting, shelving, just getting the room completely set, ready for a reveal shot. That takes quite a long time. I want to show you this is a a fully functional kind of lived in kitchen and that won't happen for a good couple of months yet but hopefully you get a general idea of what's involved in the actual fitting of the kitchen it's not a straightforward job it's one of those jobs that you've really really got to put a lot of attention into getting everything perfectly perfectly level i've used the laser i've used multiple spirit levels everything's as perfect as it can get as I say, we've got the folks coming to template all of this up for the granite uh, where quartz. They're coming tomorrow and they really don't like it if they come out and find the units are all wonky and all over the place. But hopefully, if nothing else, you can get an appreciation from this of what kitchen fitters have to go through. As I say, it's not really a DIY job unless it's a very small kitchen. You need a lot of quite specialist tools. Uh, big tools that I've used for this, uh, table saw, chop saw, track saw, jigsaw, uh, multi-cutter, multiple different types of drills, SDS drill, combi, impact. If you don't have all of those tools, life's going to be a lot harder. So uh, yeah, weigh it up. If you're a competent DIYer and you have the gear, then yeah, you can fit a kitchen. But if your comfort bubble is limited to putting up shelves and pictures, then I would suggest you get the professionals out. Similar to bathroom fitting, mistakes that you make early on in the process can have a massive knock-on effect later down the line. For example, if you don't get the cupboard spacings exactly right, you'll be fighting a losing battle getting your doors all aligned properly later down the line. You'll not know that until you come to actually fitting the dishwasher door, your cupboard doors and everything, and then you're really struggling to get everything aligned properly. Now, as is often the case, it's taken me so long to edit this video. I filmed it back in July and it's uh, end of September now. It's getting a bit chilly, actually. And just at the point I'm about to make this video live, Dell, the tall carpenter, has also made a series of videos about fitting a kitchen. So this all quite neatly ties together. So give Dell a follow. Top bloke, really good channel. The tall carpenter, I'll include a link down below. Well worth your time to watch an actual professional fitting a kitchen as opposed to someone who fits one once every five years or something. Thing. Anyway, we'll leave it at that for today because this video is already crazily long. If I've missed anything glaring, then please post it down in the comments below. And obviously, don't forget to hit subscribe so that you can see all the last little bits that I'm going to film separately and you'll get to see the final reveal of what this kitchen looks like as a finished project as well. For now, folks, take care, look after one another, be nice to one another, and we shall see you next time. Tatty bye!